And we see this in Ezekiel chapter 37. By the way, probably the clearest passage in the Bible about the Messiah. Ezekiel says, my servant David will be king over them. Who's speaking, by the way, in this passage? God is speaking. God is saying, my servant David will be king over them, and they shall have one shepherd. They will follow my commandments and be careful to observe my laws. They shall live in the land that I gave to my servant Jacob, in which your fathers dwelled. They and their children and their children's children will dwell on it forever. And my servant David will be a leader for them forever. I will seal a covenant of peace with them. It will be an eternal covenant with them. And I will emplace them and multiply them. And I will set my sanctuary among them forever. My dwelling place will be among them. And I will be a God to them. And they will be a people to me. Then the nations will know that I am Hashem who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary will be among them forevermore. Here in this paragraph, the clearest paragraph in the Bible about the Messiah, we see that God is spoken of very separately than this servant of David. It's not the same being. Now on the topic of the Messiah, one of the major problems that we would have with the Christian Bible is the whole Christian Bible is one long assertion that Jesus was the Messiah. So if they're wrong about that, that's a very good reason for rejecting the New Testament. In the Tanakh, in the Jewish Bible, what do we see about the Messiah? Follow carefully. We see that there are hundreds of passages that describe a future utopian world. There are hundreds of passages in our Bible that describe a future utopian world where, one, the Jewish people return to God in national repentance and embrace the Torah. One thing the Bible tells us is that today in the world, maybe 20% of Jews really are following the Torah. The Bible is telling us one day all the Jewish people will embrace God and embrace the Torah. Number two, the Jewish people will be regathered and reunited in their ancestral homeland. The Jewish people are not going to be living on Bathurst Street anymore. <laughs> Believe it or not, Jewish people are going to be living in Eretz Israel, at least almost all of us. And not just the people of Judah. The ten lost tribes will be reunited with us. So if there are only maybe 13 million Jews in the world today, we're talking about another, who knows, 80, 90, 100, 20, 200 million people coming. It's going to be tight in Tel Aviv. <laughs> Three, we're going to live there in peace. The Bible says when we come back to our land, it's going to be not in warfare. It's going to be in peace. Number four, the Holy Temple will be rebuilt and put into full use. How do we get forgiven for our sins? In the Christian Bible, it says it straight out in Hebrews chapter 9. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. For a Christian model for forgiveness, the only way you can be forgiven according to the Christian Bible and especially according to the teachers of Christianity, especially Protestant teachers, the only way of being forgiven is to have blood sacrificed on your behalf. That's the only way. We're going to see that in the Jewish Bible, it's not so simple. In the Jewish Bible, the sacrifices in and of themselves were not able to get you forgiven. The Bible says, for example, that the sacrifice of a wicked person is an abomination to the Lord. If a person thinks that if they did the wrong thing, and the way they're going to get forgiven is by taking an animal and slaughtering it, and taking its blood and spritzing it on the altar, and that's it, I'm forgiven, the Bible says, no, that's an abomination. That's disgusting. It would be like the person who offended their spouse and they think that all they need to do to be forgiven is to show up at home with some flowers. Here, I know how much you love flowers. The spouse is going to throw the flowers back in the face because that's what the Bible's saying. The sacrifice of an evil person, of a wicked person, is an abomination to the Lord. What does God expect for us to forgive us? He expects us basically to change. If sinning means that we've gone away from God, so to be forgiven, we have to come back to God. We have to change our ways. We have to, in the Bible's words, it's called repentance. Teshuvah, repentance really means to return. We're returning to God. When we sin, sin means we're straying. The word sin means to miss the mark. We're off target. To get back on target is the way we get forgiven. Now, if the spouse 
really wants to be forgiven, they've got to take responsibility. They have to say, you know what, I'm, I'm so sorry for what I did. I know it was horrible. I feel terrible. And they have to basically express their remorse. They have to basically express their responsibility and they're taking ownership of what they did. They have to beg for forgiveness. Please, I, I beg you, forgive me. They've got to promise and make an assurance they're going to change, they're going to be different, meaning they have to go through a process of transformation. That's what will take to be forgiven. And if they're smart, they'll bring some flowers as well. <laughs> but the flowers are not the essence of the process. The flowers are not the essence. So if the spouse is allergic to flowers, or if the person's too poor to bring flowers, or if there's no store open at four in the morning when they're coming home, whatever the problem is, if for some reason you're prevented from bringing the flowers, the real heartfelt, sincere apology and resolve to change, that's the essence of being forgiven. Let's look on page eight in the book of Ezekiel. Now you, son of man, say to the house of Israel, Thus you have spoken, you Jews have spoken, you've been wondering, saying, since our sins and our iniquities are upon us, and we are wasting away because of them, how can we live? The Jewish people are wondering about this question. If we are, have violated our relationship with God, if we have been sinning and living improperly and living out of fellowship with God, and we have broken our relationship, how can we ever restore our relationship and live? They're asking the question, the ultimate question, how do we overcome sin? God says, say to them, as I live, the word of the Lord Hashem, that I do not desire the death of the wicked one, but rather that the wicked one turn from his way that he may live. Repent, repent for your evil ways. Why should you die, O house of Israel? The prophet says, the path to forgiveness from sin is by changing, by turning, by returning to God. That's what it's all about. And every single passage in the Bible, it's repeated dozens of times, says the same thing. Second Chronicles chapter 7, If my people who are called by my name humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin. That's what it's all about, changing. You're not going to get forgiven if you're the same miserable person. Bottom of the page, Isaiah 55. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord that he may have mercy on them to our God that he may abundantly pardon. It's all about turning away from sin. The book of Jonah. We know the famous story where Jonah comes to the city of Nineveh. And Jonah says, God's very upset with you for your sins. The book of Jonah says, not that they started bringing sacrifices, the book of Jonah says they turned from their evil ways. And it says when God saw what they had done, how they turned from their evil ways, God relented concerning the evil he said he would bring upon them. He didn't do it. They were forgiven because they changed. All right. So the rabbi had a lot to say today. And... Um, I think the main, first of all, I just want to deal with his first part of what he said. Why is Israel not restored? He's basically saying, under the Messiah, Israel is restored. The whole world becomes teaching from the Jews, from Jer Jer Jerusalem, by this Messiah King. And why is Israel not restored if Jesus is the Messiah? And that's a good question. Now, Christians through the New Testament understand that, that there are two parts to the ministry of Jesus. The first coming and the second coming. And in the first coming was an introduction, uh, um, a fulfilling of the old covenant. He fulfilled it and began the new covenant. So this is a new thing, and that has been prophesied. And in the uh, Hebrew Bible, it's not exactly clear of the first and second coming. Is uh, uh, that we kind of look at the prophecies and have to rightly divide the word to figure out, okay, what is 
the first coming and what is the second coming. It, it's sort of, uh, there are two phases to this fulfillment. And in the second coming, that's when the kingdom will be fully restored. Uh, so Jesus came and he fulfilled the Torah and became the offering and uh, brought out his law, which is a a uh, magnification of the law of Moses. And now we have to decide whether we are going to believe Jesus or not. Uh, whether we believe Jesus is the Messiah or not. And on his second coming, the final judgment is very much based upon that, whether we believe it or not. So um, now the rabbi, he seems to um, just skip straight to um, what Jesus did but leave Jesus out of it. Um, and that's confusing to me, is how did he get from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant? He, he se seems to say, well, he's all about the Torah. And then he jumps up to Ezekiel describing uh, the um, forgiveness and, and Isaiah and all these prophets talking about the new covenant, but he never talks about how he got from the old covenant to the new covenant. He just kind of takes it for granted and says, well, you know, the sacrifice is just the flowers. You know, you, you repent and that's your forgiveness. The sacrifice is just the flowers. And so it's just a gesture of gratitude. Um, but actually the Torah has quite a different view of that. So let's start with where he talks about um, the Apostle Paul in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22. Where Paul says, Moreover, he's talking about okay, what Moses did. Um, Moses sprinkled the blood, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God has enjoined to you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. So there is no forgiveness. There's no, there's no taking away of the sin without shedding of blood. Um, so what is Paul talking about? Well, first of all, Paul, when Paul was alive, the temple was standing in Jerusalem and was in use. And the Jews of those days were criticizing Paul, and even Rabbi Scobet was criticizing Paul for even saying that the temple is no longer required, and criticizing the Torah, or criticizing Paul for saying the Torah is not, um, is changed. But now, now the rabbi is criticizing Paul for saying that the temple is needed. So this is where it gets confusing. So Paul says, okay, without blood, um, there is no remission. There is no forgiveness. And so now the question is, okay, does the Torah say that? Does the Torah really say that? Well, if we look at Leviticus chapter 17, 
Remember, the Torah is uh, the first five books of Moses. Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That is the Torah. Uh, so, if we look at Leviticus 17, um, verse 10 and 11, basically, and whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, or of the strangers that sojourn among you, that eateth any manner of blood, I will set my face against that soul that eats blood, and I will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar. So blood b belongs upon the altar. To make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. So what is an atonement? An atonement is uh, a, a, a remission, a, a restoration of the soul. That's the atonement, the um, making amends. That's the making amends to God. So that's the forgiveness. That's the part of it. It's not just flowers. It's part of the process of making. So what he was talking about is you have to be repentant when you come to the altar. Otherwise, you're, if, if your heart isn't truly wanting re, uh, re, um, restoration, then your sacrifice will not be acceptable. So you have to truly want the restoration and give the sacrifice. And that is the uh, remission of sin in the Torah. So it's not just the flowers. It's a part of the process of being forgiven. And we also see that here. Okay, um, If we look at... Uh, Numbers chapter 19, verse 1 to 9. And the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron. You know, Aaron was the first high priest. He was the brother of Moses, and his family, his bloodline, was made priests forever. Okay? Um, this is the ordinance of the law which the Lord has commanded, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they bring thee a red heifer. What's a heifer? It's a cow, a red cow, okay? Without spot, wherein no blemish, and upon which never came a yoke. And you shall give her to Eliezer the priest, that he may bring her forth without the camp, and one shall slay her before his face. And Eliezer the priest shall take of her blood with his finger, and sprinkle of her blood directly before the tabernacle of the congregation seven times. And one shall burn the heifer in his sight. Her skin and her flesh and her blood with her dung shall he burn. And the priest shall take the cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet and cast it into the midst of the burning of the heifer. Then the priest shall wash his clothes and he shall bathe his flesh in water. And afterward he shall come into the camp and the priest shall be unclean until the evening. And he that burns her shall wash his clothes in water and bathe his flesh in water and shall be unclean until the evening. And a man that is clean shall, be, shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and lay them up outside the camp in a clean place and it shall be kept for the congregation of the children of Israel for a water of separation it is a purification for sin. Okay? 
So uh, there you go. The, this, there's, there's a pure. This is this red heifer is part of a purification from sin, and now. Um, I'll show you a quick video, uh, a screenshot video now about uh, what's going on about that right now. So this here, you can see the um, the URL at the top, the templeinstitute.org, and this is the Temple Institute in Jerusalem. And what is the Temple Institute? Bringing the Holy Temple to life every day. Okay? Speak to the children of Israel and have them take from me an offering from every person whose heart inspires him to generosity. You shall take my offering. So the Temple Institute is dedicated to making the Holy Temple a reality in our day and toward this end the Temple Institute has for 36 years been building and planning and researching and teaching and sharing with you our reconstructed sacred vessels and priestly garments <clears throat> our books and paintings our red heifer candidates our teachings and insights and our love for Hashem and the Holy Temple. Support the Holy Temple Institute. The half shekel offering. And there's the a model of the temple in Jerusalem. So about us. About us. Statement of principles. Okay. Who are these people? The Temple Institute is dedicated to us all aspects of divine commandment for Israel to build a house for God's presence, the Holy Temple on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. The range of the Institute's involvement with this concept includes education, research, activism, and actual preparation. Our goal is firstly to restore temple consciousness and reactivate those forgotten commandments. We hope that by doing our part, we can participate in the process that will lead to the Holy Temple becoming a reality once more. Why build the temple? Why the fuss over an ancient, seemingly outdated concept? What relationship does the Holy Temple have to our world today? The people of Israel have lived without a temple for nearly 2,000 years and seem to be doing fine without one. We don't seem to need it. And God certainly doesn't think... <coughs> and God certainly doesn't. So why think about rebuilding? Nothing can be further from the truth. Miamonides teaches. Miamonides is a, a famous Jewish scholar uh, that left many writings that is highly respected in the, among in Judaism. Miamonides teaches that the performance of all the commandments are not dependent on the coming of the Messiah. They are to be ful fulfilled at all times. God does not change his mind or nullify any of the commandments included in the Torah, which were given once for all time. In lieu of temple service, we may observe various remembrances of these commandments, but that is all they are, merely gestures of nostalgia. Fish out of water, but we fool ourselves if we think that the state of Judaism today without the temple is normal. On the contrary, we are like fish out of water. If one third of all the Torah's commandments center on the temple, it would seem that biblical observance in the temple's absence is but a skeleton 
of what God had intended it to be. So you can continue reading this if you want to go on and take a look. Um, now, what else do we have? Study tools. Red heifer. What is a red heifer? Oh, a red cow. Okay. The mystery of the red heifer. A divine promise of purity. Then I shall sprinkle pure waters upon you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, and from all your idols. I will cleanse you. I will also give you a new heart, and I will place within you a new spirit. Ezekiel 36. Following the depths in-depth study of the history and tradition of the Red Heifer has been ex excerpted from the book, Mystery of the Red Heifer, uh, a book written by a rabbi. Okay, so let's uh, go down to the Red Heifer, Understanding Biblical Purity. Okay. There's the Red Heifer. Understanding the concept of biblical purity, an idea that defies translation. Okay, causes, uh, let's see, causes of impurity. Impurity is moral impurity they're talking about. Um, something that is beyond physical uh, unclean, uncleanliness. It's a moral impurity and how to be clean morally and how to purify the soul it's basically what this is talking about um, you can come to this website and take a look at it yourself if you want but that's the basic idea um, the highest level of sanctity okay uh, why must the tribe of Aaron, right here, why must the tribe of Aaron stand back from contact with the dead? In reality, when within the answer lies the core of what distinguishes Judaism, the faith of the one God of Israel. For while the ancient heathenism paid tribute to gods of death, who claimed everything and everyone as their own, and overpowered all, Judaism pays no heed to death while other religions viewed and still view life as a preparation for death and thus center their lives around death as the main event in the human experience Judaism is a separate a celebration of life okay and it goes on about life and death uh, so that this is why the the priests are commanded not to touch the dead. Now, uh, what people don't realize that I just learned myself is that um, in the Bible, the sons of Aaron, or these particular families, they were commanded to keep their bloodline pure and uh, not even to mingle with the other tribes of Israel, but the tribe of the priesthood was to keep their bloodline pure from the rest of the tribes. And they have, uh, there, there are uh, a certain people that are within Judaism today that have done that for centuries and have kept their bloodline some form of purity. Uh, the, they're part of the Aaron priesthood. And um, so these families do exist. And, and these are the families that are part of this here, uh, preparing to bring back the temple in Jerusalem. And of, uh, they've made the vessels. They have uh, some red cows. This, the red cow has to be perfect without blemish. And um, 
there's the biblical commandments about um, the Torah teaches that the positive commandment to build the temple was given by God to the Jewish people at Mount Sinai the day following Yom Kippur it is counted as one of the 613 mitzvot the commandments that Israel is perpetually obligated to fulfill uh, the Creator commanded us to erect a chosen house for His service where the sacrificial offerings will be brought for all time and the processionals and festive pilgrimages will be conducted there three times a year. And they shall make for me a sanctuary and I will dwell among them. Um, there are three major points that Maimonides teaches us. The purpose of the commandment of the building of the temple is in order to offer the sacrifices and it is a perpetual commandment that is binding upon every successive generation. The vessels of the temple are an intrinsic part of the commandment and constitute a portion of the temple structure and all the units separately and together are considered as one precept. The accepted design of the Holy Temple is that which is described in the Tractate Minute of the Babylonian Talmud. These principles are universally accepted as legally binding by the great Torah scholars throughout the generations. So you basically get the idea here that they want to build this temple and that is what um, this group here is all about and that they teach that it is absolutely necessary for the temple to be built. So it's not something that doesn't exist. It's not something that is just out there. There's a lot of Christians also that are in on this, um, supporting this, um, building the third temple because it's been prophesied, um, and they, you know, since it's been prophesied, they see this is God's will, and we are going to do this. Okay, so we saw in that video how there's a third temple uh, in the process or wanting to be built. Um, now, what do I have to say to that as a Christian? It's, it's kind of, um, to me, it always makes me think of Isaiah chapter 66. Let's see Isaiah chapter 66. Um, the, how I see that God, I think he's talking about the new covenant under Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, in, to a Christian, Jesus is the red heifer. Jesus is the sacrifice. And by believing in him, you are putting his blood on your soul. It's a spiritual process. And, and it's saying, okay, be, you're saying because he shed his blood for me. So spiritually, that puts his blood on my behalf and this is what the blood sacrifice this is where the blood sacrifice on earth ends um, it's been fulfilled that's how he says it is finished that's what he said on the cross so he's fulfilled that now um, so in Isaiah ch chapter 66 Starting in verse 1, okay, God says, Thus says the Lord, The heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you build to me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things has my hand made, and all those things have been, says the Lord. But to this man I will look, 
even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembles at my word. That's the person that God will re regard. A person of contrite spirit that comes with a true heart of um, wanting to change, wanting to repent and to ask God for forgiveness for whatever sin he has done. Like we live in a sinful world, you know, there's a lot of sins going on. So nobody really gets free of all that. Um, now he goes on to say, he that kills an ox is as if he slew a man. He that sacrifices a lamb is as if he cut off a dog's neck. He that offers an oblation as if he offered swine's blood, pig's blood, which is completely forgiven in the Torah, or completely forbidden in the Torah. And he that burns incense as if he blessed an idol. Yeah, they have chosen their own ways. So how is this their own ways? This is the stuff, the kind of stuff that was done in the temple. How is this their own ways? It's because God has changed. God is, Jesus has fulfilled that. So now anyone who does that, those things, that's their own ways. That's not God's ways. God has a, a way that he has shown. And this is their own ways. Okay? And he says, yeah, they have chosen their own ways and their soul delights in their abominations. I will choose their delusions and bring their fears upon them because when I called, none did answer. And when I spoke, they did not hear. But they did evil before my eyes and chose that in which I delighted not. Because God has changed things and he does not delight in sacrifices of cows. So how do you suppose that would work out if they bring, they rebuild the temple in Jerusalem and they bring this red heifer and sacrifice a red heifer and show up before God with a cow. When God sent Jesus and they rejected Jesus, and instead they bring a cow. Um, to me, that's not going to go over well with God, because from a Christian standpoint, that's a complete rejection of Jesus. But to them, their delusions are that God is going to, there's going to be this great awakening. Um, God's going to finally say, oh, you finally brought the red heifer. I've been waiting all this time for, you know, it's, it just, this is the difference, okay? So that's like those Jews on the website there, they are interested in the Torah. But what confuses me is this rabbi. Like, where does he get from the Torah to what he's saying now? Like, how do you get around the red heifer? How do you forget about the, you know, it, the flowers? Um, so, does he believe in the Torah or not? Like, is w when do you get, like, from the Torah to the prophets? When does the old covenant end and the new covenant begin? That's the part that he just doesn't talk about. And so he acts as if it's always been. It's always been this way. That as long as you have a contrite heart and humble yourself to God, then he'll forgive you and it's all good. That's not the way it was in the old covenant. 
it was all centered around the temple and the sacrificial system that was absolutely essential. And I showed you the group, there's a group of Jewish people, Jewish Torah scholars, who would completely agree with that statement. But somehow the rabbi here, Rabbi Shobek, he doesn't seem to agree with that. But he never explains how, why he doesn't agree with that. That's the problem that I see here. And, uh, like, when did the Torah end for him, for Rabbi Skobek? When did the sacrifice end? Um, so it ended when Rome destroyed the temple. So, who ended it? Like, who ended this for, for the Rabbi Skobek? This, this sacrificial obligation that God placed upon Israel, when did that end? Did Rome end it or did Jesus end it?